Thank you, Micah. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome. It's lovely to be with you this evening. Well, let's start, jump straight into our topic tonight. Um, up on the screen, we have a very common or recognisable universal symbol. It's one that the world knows everywhere throughout the world. It's a cross, and it's something that is used commonly in identifying Christian organisations for the whole, whole world over. And it's something that is very well known, and it's very much associated with the death of one man and the man who we come here to talk about tonight, that of our Lord Jesus Christ. For a lot of churches, the cross is something of very high importance. It's often used in their decoration and it's used externally as a symbol on their venues and it's a symbol that they place a high amount of importance on. But I suppose for us as Bible students, that is, the symbol of the cross is, but a very, is a part of why we think this man Jesus Christ is so important. Hence why this evening we're doing a series on three very distinct, very separate parts of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Micah has so, so well shown for us, this man Jesus Christ, he was special. He was an amazing man. Um, he was truly the biggest and, and, and the, the greatest influencer that the world has ever known. So many influences we see in the world today. Uh, but Jesus Christ was the best and we look forward to Anthony continuing on uh, after myself in showing how his influence is going to be continuing again into the future in his session. But for the people that were living in the time of Christ, his death had a huge impact or would have had a huge impact. It was something that they would have experienced. They would have experienced the horror of this crucifixion, the brutality, the shame that was brought upon in such a, such a death. And the violent nature of his crucifixion on the cross was something that those people that experienced it would have had to live with for the rest of their life and it would have been absolutely memorable. Forever this, this event would have been burnt into their memories. But what does it mean for you and me sitting here this evening? What does it mean for us here tonight, 2,000 or so years later on? So hopefully in the next few minutes what we're going to be able to show is that it does uh, have a great importance and we'll be able to taste of what it means. It means a heck of a lot. It means a massive amount and it's of the uttermost importance for each one of us in hall here this evening. Now as we know Micah has told us that Christ's life was amazing. We saw that and he mentioned that his life was one of perfect obedience to the laws of his God in, in heaven or his father. That's a given. We know that. But for us to truly appreciate the reason for the Lord Jesus Christ's death we need to go back, all the way back to the beginning of time, the very start of the Bible, all the way back into the book of Genesis, to fully appreciate the reason that he had to die and what his death actually accomplished for each one of us sitting here this evening. I want you to take your thoughts all the way back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden. God has just created an amazing world. He's put effort in. His angels have created it. It's a wonderful man. He's created man and woman. He's given everything they wanted. Everything that they could have desired is given to them in this garden. And men and women in this garden are living in what we describe as a limbo state. They weren't living forever, but they also weren't mortal dying creatures either. And God had created the world in a state which we're going to describe tonight as, as a very, very good state. So what I want to do is we're going to get this little bit of blue tack on here. And we're going to put very good state at the top of our board up here. All right, so God's created this world in a very good state. And he gives Adam and Eve a very simple law. He tells them that they could eat of all the trees in the garden. They could do whatever they wanted, look after the animals. But they weren't allowed to eat of one particular tree, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Very simple law. Very, very simple. And God said simply that they, if they did eat of this tree, if they choose to eat of this tree, that they would die. Well, as we know as humans, what do we do? When humans get involved in things, things generally go wrong. And these humans, Adam and Eve, they couldn't help themselves and they ate of the fruit. They disobeyed God's command, the one command that he gave them, the only command that he gave them, they disobeyed and they sinned and they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what we're going to do is going to put up on our board the fact that they sinned that here. So Adam and Eve did something wrong and they sinned. Now you tell me, what should have God done in this instance? What should have God done? Should he have backed down? Should he have not gone through with the promise? 
well, you wouldn't parent your children that way, and I wouldn't try, try not to parent my children that way. So actually, God had to go through with his promise. He went through with his promise, and to Adam and Eve, because of their sin, he condemned them to death. As a result of their sin, the consequences of their sin, it resulted in their death. So what we're going to do is going to put death up on this board here, right down the bottom. All right, so we can see what's happening there. There's a progression. Now, they weren't to die straight away. It wasn't going to be an instant death. But they, now, all of a sudden, Adam and Eve were no longer in this wonderful limbo state that God had created for them. They were, in fact, slowly decaying mortal creatures. They'd got themselves into a proper mess because of their sin, because of their disobedience of the one commandment that God gave them. Try to put yourself in God's shoes, if we can. He's just made this wonderful creation. He's given them one commandment. And his humans that he created, the people that he loved dearly, have absolutely gone and made an absolute mess of everything that he'd set out to create. This wasn't the idea that God had set out to create. Well, what does God do? Well, he kicks them out of his garden. He bars the entrance, he kicks them out of the garden, he gives a, a whole series of punishments onto Adam and Eve. No less the greatest punishment that we've just got up on our board there of the fact that they were now to die. Adam and Eve now are becoming dying mortal creatures, just like me and you. Just like me and you. Which is interesting, because we are dying mortal creatures, but yet we were not the ones that have eaten of the fruit. And we might think that's unfair. Well, the book of Romans tells us the reason why we are dying mortal creatures. The book of Romans tells us this. It says, Wherefore... As by one man, sin, uh, one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passes on all men, for that all have sinned. Now we may think it's unfair that we die now because Adam and Eve sinned. Well, no, we die now because we are humans and we also sin also. We all die. And the reason that we all die is because every single one of us in this hall this evening has sinned. Every single human being that has been produced by two other human beings has sinned. And it's illogical for us to think that two imperfect people could produce a perfect offspring. It's very illogical to think that. All right, so let's come back to the board behind us. God has a problem. His creation haven't listened and that they've thrown the whole future of mankind on its out of his axis and it's all out of kilter and humanity is essentially now heading down as we can see on our board on this slippery slope to eternal death and this wasn't God's plan this was not God's plan and God and so God moves he gets comes into action he moves to right the wrong that the humans have created and the way that he does this is he gets someone involved and that is his son the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the subject of our talk this evening. So what we're going to do is we're going to put on our board an alternative. We're going to put our, the Lord Jesus Christ here. We have an option. There's, a, there's another plan. The antidote for humans messing things up is told for us in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. We're told that for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. See, what we're told here is that all humans require to die because all humans, we're all human. Even the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was required to die as he too was a descendant of Adam. We're all descendants of Adam, me, you, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as in Adam, we're told, all die. Now, I want you to take your minds back to the statement that I made just before. It's a true statement. It is illogical to think that two imperfect people can produce a perfect offspring. And that's true. And so God in his grand plan of righting the wrong which humankind has done sets about to make this right. I want you to turn with me, if your Bibles are open, to the book of Romans and Romans chapter 5. And we're just going to skim the service here this evening. Please take the time to read it, this section in Romans chapter 5 in your own time and follow along as we read from verse 18 of Romans 5. It's on the screen if you don't have a Bible handy. 
We read that, therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. All right, so we have something else now that we can put on our chart behind us. We have an option of justification of life. We have life as an option now. It used to be only death. Now, if we want to put it up here, we have the option of life right up the top. Okay, so if we read this again, therefore, as by the offence of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's fair. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've got our secondary option, the righteousness of one, the free gift comes on all men unto the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, many be made righteous. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It's very repetitious, isn't it? Because of one man's sin, we die, but because of another man's actions, we have a chance of life. Now, that's a game changer. That's a game changer. That's what we're here to discuss this evening. Just as we were made sinners and ultimately mortal, we're told here in the book of Romans that we have an out, that we have a get-out clause, we have another option. And this get-out clause is none other, as we can see on our screen behind us, as the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Lord Jesus Christ, as Mike has shown us, he wasn't a normal human being. He was someone amazing. He was born of a woman, his mother Mary. But more importantly, he was the son of God. He was born of God. He was the son of a woman, but also the son of of God. And from his mother he inherited our nature. In the book of Hebrews 2 verse 14 we're told since therefore the children share in flesh and blood he himself Christ likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. And in Hebrews 4 verse 5 we're told further for we have not a high priest speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He experiences the same things we experience, the same stru struggles and sufferings. But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he never sinned. That's the difference. From two imperfect human beings, you can never have a perfect human being. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we had Christ as the son of a, a woman, Mary, and also the son of God. Born of a woman but also the Son of God, a man who had the same nature as us, and yet, as Mike has shown us, he managed to live a perfect life. That's amazing. For 33 and a half years, the Lord Jesus Christ never sinned, never did anything wrong, never gave in to his human natural desires. Absolutely mind-blowing. And when we compare this back to the original characters that we looked at this evening, in Adam and Eve, all they could fail was in eating some simple fruit. The contrast is very clear. But the question for us tonight is, okay, yes, we have seen how we get ourselves, we, how we got ourselves as humans into this predicament that we're in. And we've sort of seen how that God has given us an out, get out clause in the Lord Jesus Christ as another option. But how actually does the death of the Lord Jesus Christ get us back on track? How actually does it happen? Well, it's through one very particular thing and one very specific thing, and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ himself. You know... We've got to be quick, but throughout the scripture, the shedding of blood is a theme that runs right through the Bible from the start to the finish. It's a principle threaded through the whole of the Bible. From all the way back, if we go back to Egypt, and we might remember the ten plagues that were on the, on the Egyptians and on the children of Israel. The very last plague of the killing of the firstborn, what the children of Israel had to do is they had to go out to their farm, select a lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. They had to pen this lamb up and it had to monitor it for imperfections and see if there's any blemishes and make sure that this lamb was absolutely spot on perfect, no blemish. And at the end of the 14 days, they would kill this lamb, they would collect the blood and they would paint the blood over the doorposts and over the lintels of their house. So when the angel of death came over that house on that particular night, in order to kill the firstborn, he would see the blood on the doorpost and he would spare or protect those that were in that house. They were saved by the lamb's blood. 
And when we go back further in the scripture, all the way back to the book of Genesis, in the actual particular sin that Adam and Eve did, Adam and Eve were forgiven also in the covering, in the covering of uh, the blood of a lamb. God made the, killed a lamb and he made them garments out of the clothes and the blood was there for a covering. Once again, shed blood providing the covering for sin. And this was also reflected in the offerings that the Israelites had to offer throughout their wilderness wanderings. The shedding of blood, especially that of a lamb, was crucial to the forgiveness of sins and in order for reconciliation with God to occur. They're all signs pointing forward to the greatest lamb as a symbol, the perfect lamb, all pointing forward to this perfect lamb, this faultless lamb, which would be slain for the, for the forgiveness of sinners, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, was baptising people in a river one day and he saw Jesus coming towards him to be baptised and he said something extremely specific when we reference back to the lamb. He says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and he says, behold the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And in the book of Revelations, Jesus Christ is referred to as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, referencing back to that incident in Genesis. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ that all of us here this evening have a chance of life. It's not a given. It's conditional on certain requirements, but we are given a chance, an opportunity, a way has been directed now through Jesus Christ that we can have a hope of life. And if you're still in Romans chapter 5, take a look at verse 1 of Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So through faith, we read, we can have peace with God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and importantly, access, access to grace or forgiveness. We are given a way to life. We are saved by grace. Well, if we're saved by grace, you may think, well, the sacrifice of Christ and the shed blood, then really we don't have to do anything else. That's, that's wonderful. Jesus has done it all. We can just continue on doing what we're doing, sinning as we're sinning, uh, and Jesus has sort of done everything we need to do. Well, that's completely not, the tr not, not true because there's actual responsibility on each and every one of us. If we turn over to the second chapter in, in Romans chapter 6, Romans 6 has something to say, say about this. It says in Romans 6 verse 1, what shall we say? Then this is a question, essentially preempting what we've just said. Shall we just continue sinning because Jesus has done everything? No. The question is, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, a simple answer to that question is given in the following verse. Two words, God forbid. No, no, no. No, no, no means. We cannot just continue sinning because we are covered by Christ. No way. The chapter goes on by saying that it is essential that we are baptised into Christ and that we are to live a life of obedience to the will of his Father just as Jesus Christ himself did. And that through serving God and not trying to serve ourselves our own desires, we will fail, however. We can have forgiveness for our sins and be reconciled or made right to God, which ultimately brings us to the path of life eternal. So that's our time for tonight. Uh, essentially, mankind, way back in the beginning, they messed things up. They got us on a path that was heading to death. But God fixed things up and he got us, brings us on a path back to life. It's a plan and a way that you too can be part of through baptism, through the sacrificial perfect life of his dear son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into the name of Jesus Christ. And if we live a life as best we can to the obedience of the will of God, we too can have a hope of the future, which Anthony is now going to show us as well.